Welcome to Critical Connections, where we analyze social, political, and religious trends related to Muslims here in the US and around the world. Today, we're going to talk about growing religious intolerance in Pakistan and discuss ways in which it can be addressed. On July 29th, an American citizen of Pakistani descent, Tahir Ahmed Naseem, was gunned down in a Peshawar courthouse by an assailant who suspected him of being an Ahmadi which is a persecuted minority sect, sect in the country. Two days after the murder, hundreds rallied in support of the killer, who was then hailed a hero. Just last month, the construction of a Hindu temple was halted in Islamabad when hardliners from various segments of society, political parties, religious groups, even ordinary citizens, protested the government's use of taxpayers' money to build the temple. To discuss the factors that have enabled this environment of bigotry, prejudice, and violence against religious minority groups in Pakistan, we are joined by Faranaz Ispahani. She is the author of Purifying the Land of the Pure, Global Fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center, and a former member of parliament in Pakistan. Farah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So, for our Pakistan's founder, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, had outlined a very pluralist vision for Pakistan at the time of independence in 1947. Just days before Pakistan declared independence, he had said, and I quote, you are free, you are free to go to your temples, you are free to go to your mosques or to any other places of worship in this state of Pakistan. You may belong to any religion, caste or creed that has nothing to do with the business of the state. We are starting in the days where there is no discrimination, no distinction between one community and another, no discrimination against one caste or creed. We are starting with this fundamental principle that we are all citizens and equal citizens of one state. Now, could you begin by identifying key moments in Pakistan's history which tended to undermine Jinnah's very pluralist vision and really created this hostile environment for religious minority groups? Well, I think, um, as you said, uh, Mr. Jinnah, um, the Pakistan's first prime minister, uh, Liaquat Ali Khan, um, a lot of his closest confidants and friends, including my grandfather, M.H. Isfahani, etc., um, had lived a very different life, had lived among many different ethnicities, religious communities, and had grown up in a very sort of multi-ethnic and a very pluralistic sort of society. Mm -hmm. So they really, in a way, I feel, did not understand what was coming when they crossed these borders. Um, they expected that, in a way, that Islam, in the way they saw it, as an umbrella of protection, um, a reflection of the Prophet Muhammad, um, which was about peace and uh, which was about um, treating everyone in the community with equality. Mm -hmm. That's what they understood uh, Islam to be. Right. And they did not think that Islam was going to be the law of the state. Mm -hmm. else that Muslims in Pakistan would be free to follow their religions, to be free to follow their state. For example, Mr. Jinnah himself is Shia, considered Ahmadis as Muslims, had, was married to a woman of Parsi um, faith and upbringing, um, and his cabinet had Hindus, had people of all, all the different Pakistani um, groupings as we see them today. But we see very soon after that Mr. Jinnah is very, very sick and he starts to fade away almost right after the creation of Pakistan. And those very people, those clerics, those actors who fought against the creation of Pakistan were the people who managed to influence secular po politicians, you know, urban educated politicians, even like people like Liaquat Ali Khan, but going forward to Zulfitar Ali Bhutto. And they ended up in the name of expediency, 
um, setting the seeds, sowing the seeds for the country we have today, where you see what Hindus and Christians in Pakistan are going through. You see how Ahmadi Muslims cannot even consider themselves uh, Muslims in their own country. And you just see all of these laws that were came about. So the first one I would say is um, the first con uh, constitution of Pakistan was passed under Yaqut Ali Khan mm -hmm. in um, 1956, if I remember, yeah, 56. And that included the objectives resolution. Now the objective resolution on one hand said that all citizens of Pakistan were equal, but on the other hand, it said Islam was the religion of the state. Mm -hmm. Now this was already a great, um, blow, frankly, to those of us who look back at history and see how it affects the modern day polity. But at that point, um, it was not made um, operational in that way, but mm -hmm. it existed. Um, then you see a little later on, you see a Khan, and you see a Khan starting to put the objective resolution passing laws, um, making all of these uh, things real, mm -hmm. as opposed to just, you know, um, a preamble to the constitution, which it was. It was just an expression of a will or a wish. So basically, yeah, 1962, he made um, the objective resolution part of the constitution. And then after that, you see Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, again, someone who had great personal relations with the Ahmadi community. But he thought what he was making was something which is a political move and could be reversed. And so it was under him that you see parliament passing the first the first anti um, yeah, in, um, in our parliament in Pakistan. But that was not the end of it. Then we get to Zia, and Zia picks on the anti emedy laws. He picks on every facet he can, any loophole, and moves uh, to take the British blasphemy laws and turn them into something which the British had had the spirit was to healing of another society so that Hindus should not upset their Muslim neighbors and Muslims should not uh, of their neighbors. So um, that, I mean, I'm not saying the British are not culpable. They did create these laws, but those laws were taken and weaponized by Zia al -Haq. And from that day on, for I, the Ahmadi community, I would say the Christians, um, and now all Muslims, it has become, I would say, the most deadly weapon of all. And um, that is thanks to Zia al Haq and his institutionalization of a very harsh Islamization that was not re from our region and was not what our people knew. Sure. And we will, um, you know, sort of uh, talk about uh, the blasphemy laws um, in just a little bit. Uh, but Farah, you know, you sort of mentioned the role of religious leaders and how they came to assert themselves right from the very beginning of Pakistan's creation. You know, we had religious leaders like Maulana Maududi and others um, who were against this notion of a modern nation state, which required equal citizenship for all of its citizens, regardless of faith and creed. Um, and, you know, even people who came after them, you know, the, 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 the religious parties that came after them, they, you know, increasingly became more assertive in marginalizing the role and religious freedoms of non-Muslim Pakistanis. How did they, one, um, you know, how did they 
gain so much power and influence within this new polity of Pakistan. And, you know, even now we see that they don't do very well in the polls. Religious parties do not. But how do they have so much power? Is it their um, street power that, uh, you know, successive administrations have been afraid of or have successive administrations used them for advancing um, domestic and international agendas um, that for which they rely on them for support? I think it's a combination of both. Um, you see that when the ordinary citizen goes to vote, they will very rarely, as they see it, waste a vote on a religious party. Um, but on the other hand, there's a call for a march of the burning of a Christian, um, um, you know, a Hindu temple or a Christian church or an Ahmadi mosque, the two mosques that were attacked and that terrible attack in Lahore a few years ago, you will suddenly see the power of these people. So their congregations and their tentacles in society have spread to such a point where no matter whether it's a... Um, a civilian government today or a military government, they all need them. And they need them for different things. The Pakistani military uses them um, for jihad in Kashmir and for other, um, I would say, you know, um, non, um, in ways that are um, not constitutional. Um, our in intelligence services do the same. And so because they need them, when these parties and when their um, tentacles get into society in the way that they are and they go forth and carry out a carnage of killing within Pakistan, the military and the intelligence services don't keep them locked up or keep them in amazingly luxurious circumstances and never take them to task. So basically, we've created this hydra, this many-headed monster, and that many-headed monster has been protected and has been fed by the state and has been given all these laws, which have emboldened them now to feel they are above the state. Right. They can lure an American citizen to a courtroom in Pakistan under false pretenses and shoot that person, shoot that man dead on allegations of blasphemy. And what happens? Nothing happens. Nothing happens except you see hordes of people in the streets celebrating again the murderer and not praying for the soul of the murdered. And we saw this with Salman Tasir when I was serving in parliament. Um, we saw this with Shabazz Bhatti, who was my colleague in parliament, in fact. Um, we've seen this again and again. In Pakistan today, you cannot bring up the word even to amend the blasphemy law, let alone banish. Right. And you'd mentioned, um, you know, Governor Salman Dasir of Punjab and then um, Minister uh, Shabazz Patti, both of whom were gunned down because of their defense of um, Asia Bibi and just their appeal to, you know, repeal the blasphemy laws or amend them. Um, just for that reason, they were gunned down. And, for, you know, you mentioned the role of the military and absolutely the military has used um, various groups. And we have so many different kinds of militant groups in Pakistan that are used for um, you know, um, uh, against India, they were used in Afghanistan, you know, for different for external purposes to advance foreign policy agendas, but also internally sectarian. We have so many sectarian organizations that are also used for the same purpose. But I mean, I'll have to say that, you know, even political administrations, civilian administrations have not been able to stand up to these militant organizations or hardliners. And, um, you know, even just now, uh, 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 
Imran Khan's administration, for instance, right? Two years ago, he tried to appoint a, um, uh, a Dr. Atif Mia to the Economic Advisory Council when people heard that he was an Ahmadi, when uh, Dr. Atif Mia was an Ahmadi. Again, there were protests, there was such a huge ruckus, and the uh, Imran Khan administration backed down. Again, with the Hindu temple, this was a good step that the government was taking, was trying to provide public funds for the building of the construct for the Hindu temple, as it does for mosques, as it does for other places of worship. Um, and then again, there was this huge, um, you know, reaction and backlash, and then the government backed down. And so we see that as a familiar pattern with nobody, whether it's the civilian administration or law enforcement or judges, nobody's able to really withstand the intimidation that comes from these religious parties and groups. Well, you see the same thing um, today in um, India. India with its secular constitution, its preamble, which is very, very strong about all citizens being equal and India being a secular state. The moment you weaponize the religion of the majority, majoritarianism, and we in Pakistan actually, it's been the most tragic thing because this was the birth of a new country. Right. And a lot of people in the Muslim world looked at Pakistan, looked at Mr. Jinnah as the way forward. He was not an Ataturk in a uniform. This was a man who had the breadth of knowledge and the vision to see perhaps what may come ahead. Um, I um, was not always for the partition of India and Pakistan. I found it problematic, but today obviously one sees what's happening in India. But then, you know, in a way we led the way. So the point is, it, I don't feel any civilian government is any better. But part of it now is that when you had two members of the government I served stand up, that terrified everyone. You know, um, I at that point, um, when I remember when Shabazz Bhatti was killed and the first National Assembly session after that, um, a colleague of mine, a woman who has since died, stood up and said, um, you know, we should read a Fatiha, no, we should read a prayer mm -hmm. um, for his soul, for Shabazz, Shabazz's soul. And there was another Catholic member of parliament and he said, I will read it. And we all, you know, nobody stood up. The two wow. of us were standing there. Wow. Our colleague, our friend, not even members of our own party. And we should mention that he was Christian himself. He was Christian. And so nobody stood up for Shabazz Clement Patti, who had been gunned down and who had been our colleague and friend for so many years. So the point is the fear now, there are two things. One is fear. Mm -hmm. They are good people. They are good judges. They are good legislators. But they are terrified now. They're terrified because these terrorists call up uh, judges' families and threaten them outright. We know where your daughter goes to school. We know these are real things now. They're no longer academic. Sure. And then you have this whole populace that has been brainwashed. Number one, when they think something is a law, they see that as being then they right. You know, the distinction between mob violence and um, the government taking action is no longer in Pakistan relevant on things that are attached to blasphemy or things that are attached in their minds, in the minds of these terrorists, in the minds of these clerics, these agitators. They're bloodthirsty and so they will stop at nothing. Right. And, you know, again, you mentioned the blasphemy laws. And um, and I think you suggested this earlier, that when um, the blasphemy laws were introduced in the region, in the Indian subcontinent, during British colonial rule, the idea was to protect all religions. Yes. That's why the laws were introduced. But then also um, to have a law to protect the 
a, the accused from mob violence. Yes. So that if somebody was accused of having committed blasphemy, they would be taken into custody and would be protected from you know, mob violence so that they could then just be put to trial and, uh, you know, the trial would uh, proceed accordingly. Now, it's completely different, right? It doesn't matter whether the blasphemy laws are there or not, mob violence still continues and people will find out, people who've been, you know, accused of blasphemy and they will hunt them down. Um, could you sort of start, uh, Farah, by just sort of telling us what the blasphemy laws are just in general in Pakistan's context and how they've mutated over time um, and how they've impacted various religious minority groups? Well, originally, as we were uh, mentioning, you know, this was a British law, and I had explained a little bit in the beginning, and you've just um, um, laid it out for us again what the original purpose was. Mm -hmm. But once the blasphemy laws, um, once, as I'd used the term before, Zia weaponized them, um, they have grown and grown and grown in terms of, you know, the death penalty attached to people who have been accused of blasphemy. The, the way that these laws have been used against Ahmadis in Pakistan, against Christians, against Shias, and also um, towards uh, Sunni Muslim Pakistanis who feel that this is wrong, that this is a law that is not just, this is a law that just brings violence with it. Um, a friend of mine who's a lawyer in Pakistan who only deals with these cases, mm -hmm. he, you know, he talks about his clients who have basically, on mere allegations, just been rotting in prisons because perhaps one is a professor who spoke mm -hmm. to fees who merely opened up some ideas to his um, students and the students themselves went after them. We have the story of the young man, Mashal, um, you know, a university student who was murdered, cornered, all exits sealed, butchered to death in his own university, not for having any, not for really saying anything anti-Islamic, but just asking to question. It is just what one does at university. Right. So you can't teach anymore at a university when you have an open frame of mind to question, analyze, rationalize. If you can't study at a university um, and have those views, then where are we going now? And I think that is really where one finds today um, that these laws, you know, um, from time to time, whether it's Imran Khan's government or X, Y, and Z's government, it doesn't matter. You know, Asya Bibi is released. Um, but within moments, her jail cell is taken up by another young Christian woman with very similar circumstances. Mm. So nothing has changed. Right. Asia Bibi, even in jail, had several attempts on her life. So what makes people hate that illiterate farmhand? This mother, this mother of these children, this wife, this, this human being. Because they feel she abused the Prophet Muhammad in some way. She blasphemed against him. In some cases, all someone has to say is someone, um, you know, burnt the Holy Quran or in some ways used its pages with disrespect. This is the foundation. This is it. And in so many ways, I mean, these are false allegations, right? I mean, the Supreme Court found Asya Bibi's case to be one of false allegations. We know of other cases where people just um, to settle personal feuds or uh, disputes over land will allege that so-and-so, you know, committed blasphemy. And that's all that is needed, a rumor that needs to be spread for those people then to be hunted down, even when they're taken into custody. Um, you know, people find them again in courtrooms, in courthouses, in their jail cells. And 
and will kill them, such as the environment of intolerance and just this restriction of freedom of any kind of expression. Um, so we'll come to, you know, what can be done about this. But, for, you know, even if, suppose, we get rid of the blasphemy laws, right, you know, overnight, miraculously, somehow the blasphemy laws disappear. Somehow the Second Amendment to the Constitution, which declared Ahmadis to be non-Muslims, even if that dis disappears overnight, you know, the societal intolerance that you've mentioned, right, that we've talked about, the mob violence, the lynchings, those are still going to continue. And um, so how do we change that environment? How do we address the, that, that mindset, that socialization that generations of Pakistanis have been subjected to? Now, you are talking about a whole social project for a country of almost 200 million people. This, these are people who have been socialized now. I mean, you cannot, I, the most educated Pakistanis you meet, they will say, we have no problems with Ahmadis, we don't want to hurt them. But, but sitting there as judge and jury, they are non muslim right? So what I, when I talk about the Islamization process, and of course we go back to the objectives resolution, this drip, drip, drip of hatred, this drip, drip, drip of religion as the most pernicious form of politics is something that is now seeped into our popular culture, our textbooks are replete with a little Hindu child will read a primer in school which says that Hindus are short, dark, and squat, and you know their temples are dark caves, and you know they are basically Indian agents. They are not patriotic to Pakistan. So, you know, to re-engineer Pakistan's whole body politic. This is not about one law. Of course, that one law, even an amendment, mm -hmm. will have a huge societal um, outcome, but it will mean that the government will have to have the strength. There will be targeted killings. There will be bombings. There will be attacks on families. There will be attacks on public places. But at what point are we going to try and set Pakistan right? At what point? And obviously, for me, the point was second, you know, the objective resolution and then the second, I mean, it was then. But you can never give up because you know what? The well to do may leave the country or may not because it may not affect them. But what happens to almost 200 million citizens? So a way has to be found. You can just never give up and say either that it's a failed state or it may be a failing state. But something has to be done. Right. And to write the course of justice and to write the course of history to what Muhammad Ali Jinnah wanted. Today, his community, the Shia community, if you see what's happening in Parachinar, if you see what's happening, what it has happened in Karachi and Lahore and the Hazaras, yes. the Hazaras, yes. I mean, the whole project of the purification of Pakistan, the purification to make it a pure Muslim state. Once this project was started on, so they first started by purifying the Ahmadis, which in the 50s, there was this very clear, it started in the 50s, and you get to the 70s, and you get Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, and that parliament starts the process. But so, and now you see, even Bareilly Muslims who used to be the shrine goers, who used to be what we call the soft Muslims, it's no longer just the Deobandis or the Wahhabis. The people who are killing in the name of the prophet of love, the prophet of peace are the shrine going Bareilvi Muslims. So it is so complicated for those for those who are not Pakistani to even begin to understand how does that happen. 
Right. And I remember, I think it was in the 1950s, right, when the anti Ahmadi riots first began in 1953. And there was a Munir commission um, headed by Justice Munir. And he, they had talked to so many different religious scholars in trying to sort of investigate what had happened. And they couldn't find two learned scholars of Islam who agreed on a definition of who a Muslim is. And even then, they sort of, you know, warned against the danger of trying to legislate and define who a Muslim is because that there will be no end to it and now we see that as you mentioned with Barelvis thinking their Bundis are non-Muslims and their Bundis thinking that Barelvis are an Ahle Hadith and you know even within the Sunni sects there is so much disagreement on who is Vajib al-Qatil who should be killed because he's not a Muslim. So basically now you have war in the society you know so in the stage one of pakistan because i talk about four stages in my book the first stage is you know just post partition and it is the cleansing in a way of sikhs and hindus um where you see a large i mean a million people were killed on both sides and a large transfer population and then after that that's when you get to the second stage when then it starts becoming an inward cleansing Right, right. And um, so, I mean, they are called today for Shias also to be declared non-Muslims. Um, oh. That's the way it's, go it's going. So, but as I said, you know, there have been many countries who have been on the verge of failing. But there has, there has to be a will. And with the will, you can find a way. It may be an internal civil war of ideas. It may be an internal civil war, including violence. But where do we reclaim our country? Sure, sure. And, you know, every day that passes is another day too late. Absolutely. And for you, you know, mentioned, you said that, you know, the objectives resolution in which Pakistan was defined and is as an Islamic state, mm -hmm. that is where the sort of the seed of intolerance really began. And, you know, but even now in present day Pakistan, among regular ordinary people, when we talk about uh, Jinnah's vision of a secular Pakistan, the word secular itself has been weaponized. And people sometimes think that it means anti-Islamic or anti-religion. You know, we I had a workshop in Pakistan a few years ago where we had some religious leaders and civil society, you know, non-government organizations come together to talk about these issues. And there was a lot of confusion about what the term secular meant. And some of our religious leaders felt that it meant that you're going to not allow Islam to be, you know, um, uh, expressed or, or Islam will be marginalized. But, you know, when we talked about that means separation in which all religions will be able to flourish and will be able to you know, express themselves freely, different members of different religious communities. It, you know, that sort of shifted some of the thinking around what the word secular means. Um, but now I almost feel like even that conversation can be targeted. Like it's not, there's no space for that kind of conversation left in Pakistan either. No, there's, there's very little space. And I think the basically, uh, history books, our uh, school books, the public discourse, the discourse of, for example, Imran Khan when he was running uh, for election and, you know, ended up subsequently as becoming Prime Minister of Pakistan. Throughout his campaign, he said, I will not allow anyone to touch the blasphemy laws. So not only do you have people um, unwilling to stand up. Here you have the elected prime minister saying this at campaign rallies. And so, you know, uh, the project, the project to save Pakistan is a very, very, very big one. And Absolutely. all of our, uh, in a way, it's very interesting because all of our history the fact that when Mr. Jinnah, you know, lost hope, who brought Mr. Jinnah back to the idea of Pakistan? Who were the biggest backers of Pakistan? The Ahmadi community, the leadership, the Shias, um, you know, many other communities of this kind. And so what has happened is there's been a whitewashing. And now you cannot even talk about those things. 
Absolutely. I mean, there is no political will. You mentioned in your book how, you know, when uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, when he had appointed uh, an Ahmadi, um, uh, Zafrullah Khan, to be his foreign minister, there was a lot of protests around that as well. But he was not one to be intimidated and said, no, he's the best person for the job. And so he will remain my foreign minister. And but right now in, you know, successive administrations, but even as you said, in Imran Khan's administration, you see this lack of political will to be able to or show any kind of leadership regarding these very controversial issues. Um, so in that regard, Farah, what do you think about the role of Pakistani civil society? You know, we have a very vibrant civil society and it's made up of, you know, religious leaders, amazing religious leaders like Javed Ahmed Ramdi, who unfortunately, you know, um, uh, had to leave because of the death threats against him. But he had a very, he drew from examples of the prophet, of the prophet's life from the Quran to reach a very con different conclusion about what Pakistan should look like when it comes to religious minorities. But we have, you know, religious leaders, we have non government organizations, we have a very interesting um, media landscape, you know, we have so many different um, uh, uh, segments that make up Pakistan civil society. What can, what role can they play in trying to either give these leaders a political, you know, spine to actually stand up to these issues? Or what can they do to hold our leaders more accountable and also promote religious pluralism in Pakistan? I don't think um, civil society anywhere can do the job by themselves, but I do agree with you that we have a first class um, range of leaders um, who are working on whether it's the judicial aspects, protecting people, whether they are promoting tolerance, whether they are working within communities um, to be their voices, empower them. We have we have had the best and continue to do. Um, now they don't get any hearing anymore in the corridors of power, and that has become a big problem. And the second thing today, I know you're asking me how to empower them, but when people like Professor um, Pervez Hoodboy is being um, drummed out of the halls of his university, someone who's always only wanted to live in Pakistan. You're seeing more and more of this, going after people in academia, going after people in civil society. So many people I know have fled here in the recent years. People who were, um, you know, people who were at the forefront of the women's movement, who were at the forefront of the, you know, and had the position holders at the human rights uh, corporation, human rights um, HRCP. Um, so, um, you know, I don't give up hope, but civil society cannot do it on its own. There has to be a bridge where government and the military need to be able to sit down with clerics, with civil society, with um, military leadership and civilian leadership to be able to say, look, it's not working for us. It's not working, our economy has stacked. Um, we have a terrible reputation in the world. We are not treating all citizens equally and with justice and care. So it is going to happen now, whether it, it the UN, whether it's, the Nordic countries, whether it's the West, or whether it's Muslim bloc countries, at a certain point, nobody, including countries in the Muslim world, are keen now to have Pakistanis come in, even as laborers, because they fear they don't want their own societies infected with this virus. So for Pakistan, we need to utilize our civil society, which is powerful. And, um, but it will have to do, be done within the framework of, of the rest of society. They cannot work alone. 
Right, absolutely. And whether it's, you know, changing the curriculum, sort of starting early, socializing our young generations, our, you know, upcoming generations in this idea of what, you know, religious pluralism look like, um, uh, you know, and that's a very long term project, of course. But even now, I feel like even with the new curriculum that came out, the I think the focus was still, even though it was an attempt to try and sort of mainstream, like, you know, um, streamline rather uh, the, the educational curriculum across madrasas, across public schools across government schools um, I think the objective primarily still was to build a nation with the ideology of you know Pakistan the way so it was a very ideological enterprise it has not moved to something that can be that encourage critical thinking and um, a newer way of thinking um, so uh, if I, you know you talked about well this is going to be a very large project. How do we empower civil society? What do you think is the role of Pakistani Americans, you know, who are in this country, have been for a while, there are more than 500,000 Pakistani Americans mm -hmm. with very strong connections to Pakistan. They are, you know, connected to um, sort of promoting health and education in Pakistan. They send billions of dollars worth of remittances. And some, according to, you know, uh, the recent law that was passed, are even able to vote in Pakistani elections. So there is a huge constituency here and you know and the muslim pakistanis here have also um in some ways experienced religious discrimination because of growing islamophobia here in america and perhaps we hope can now relate to some of the discrimination that religious minority groups in pakistan have also experienced what role do you think pakistani americans can play in um, protecting the rights of religious minorities in pakistan I think they can play um, a very big role um, because um, we are sitting, all of us now, in a place where we can give voice to a lot of these things which are difficult for people necessarily to give voice there. Um, Pakistani Americans invest in Pakistan, they visit uh, Pakistan, they uh, meet the top leadership they have family there, they have friends there. And I think instead of just giving money to those main school streams, which are teaching all of these things, we take one issue. We're coming up to a new election in America. Let's see how, which side that plays out. But we may be, you know, um, uh, Vice President Biden, when he was, um, head of the Foreign Relations Committee in the mm -hmm. Senate, um, he was um, the first person to work on what was then called the Biden-Luger um, bill, which was the first all civilian aid bill for Pakistan. And everything in it had to do with education, with nonprofits, with art, with social, um, um, all kinds Uh, I think we've lost you for a little bit. President. Um, but um, that kind of bill, Pakistani Americans can work towards all of those kinds of things. So in small ways, which is using their personal contacts, mm -hmm. Islamabad in Karachi and Lahore, with lawmakers and with the rulers of the moment, and also at this end, by okay. trying to push for um, aid or projects or structures that, that will help strengthen civil society, strengthen the academic world, help towards freedom of the press and freedom of scholarship and to allow our young people to be able to think freely. And that's the only way forward, I think. Okay, well, th on that positive note, uh, thank you so much for your time, Farhanaz Isfahani. We are so grateful for your insights, your expertise, your analysis, and all the work that you have done to promote religious pluralism in Pakistan. We are so grateful. Let's hope that as Pakistan gets ready to um, celebrate 73 years of independence, this is a subject that the Pakistani state and society will um, reckon, you know, sort of uh, engage with and try and um, address. I hope so too. 
Um, thank you so much for having me on, and I look forward to continuing our dialogue in different ways. I absolutely hope we'll do that. Thank you all so much for watching. Um, to learn more about our work, please um, visit criticalconnections.org. Also find us on Facebook. I will also highly recommend Farnaz Isfahani's amazing book, Purifying the Land of the Pure, um, which gives a very comprehensive history of um, the growth of religious intolerance in Pakistan. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.